Hey everyone, this is Bulba Trainer. I'm really glad that everyone liked my last video. Again, I don't want to theme my channel too much to a particular holiday, but I was glad I could bring you something Halloween appropriate. Next week will be the same with the discussion on ghost Pokemon and why some of them seem to be actual ghosts and others are... less so. This week I wanted to have another style of video though. I covered the topic of death in the Pokemon world last week, something that is very much a part of every life, but still somewhat adult. This week I wanted to focus on our real world religions and how they represent themselves in Pokemon. This is different from my theory video on what religion the Pokemon world might practice. Obviously Pokemon's main demographic is children, but as many of us have found out, it's still enjoyable for adults. Still, the presence of potential controversy is usually avoided, but I think there's more here than a lot of people realize, and maybe some references that you didn't even know. As always, when I cover controversial topics like religion or politics, I just wanted to remind everyone that this is opinion, mostly, and not meant to be demeaning or derogatory, definitely. I have a religion myself, and I think that being able to analyze these topics, even in the context of Pokemon, is part of being an adult. That being said, if you have polite comments or thoughts, I'd love to see them down below so the YouTube algorithm will like me, and don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on any future videos like the ghost type coverage next week. It's very easy to assume that Pokemon as a franchise hasn't delved too much into religion, especially if you grew up in North America or Europe and didn't have too much experience with religion outside of Christianity or monotheism in general. These are certainly depicted occasionally, and there's some borrowed symbolism, but the examples will be few and far between as the franchise does not originate in a Christian or even a monotheistic country. However, in the same way that kids are meant to understand the shoulder angel and demon in things like Spongebob or The Emperor's New Groove, religious references can make their way in without being too obvious. Bulba fact, the Shoulder Angel and Demon actually predate Christianity and have roots in polytheistic religions of ancient Greece and Rome, with beings like the Genius and Diamonds, correct ancient pronunciation, following people through their lives and influencing them for good or bad. Now, the way that these cultural icons are understood brings us to, at this point, what should be called my favorite episode, The Ghost of Maiden's Peak. Honestly, how many times have I called back to this episode? Anyway, there's a scene where Misty, trying to fight the ever-changing Ghastly, brings out a cross. This would be one of those cases of cultural depictions of religion. Misty isn't likely to be Christian, it's just an obvious ward against a vampire. In the same way, and something that I've brought up before, there's a Christian church in the episode Wherefore Art Thou Pokemon, but it's being used as a location for a wedding. Again, the context here is that even in Japan, which only has a small percentage of practicing Christians, the church is seen as a place where weddings happen. And since the episode is themed around weddings and love and a less tragic Romeo and Juliet reference, the church makes sense. But these are just the gloss, the outer layer. I want to take Mama Odie's advice and dig a little deeper. I might not get every reference, but I want to see what sort of things people might have missed if they don't know what to look for. And it's not just a cultural thing either. The place I want to start is actually a Pokemon based on Roman polytheism. Indeedy, to me, immediately called forth representation of the Lares, which are household spirits in Roman polytheism that are meant to guard the house and family. What people generally understand about Roman religion is the big names like Jupiter and Minerva, but there was also a very complex domestic cultus as well, Cultus in this context is referring to a method of worship, not cults the way we use the word today. When looking at depictions of Lares, we see the welcoming gesture is similar, and the drinking horn of the deities looks really similar to the tufts of hair on Ndidi. The Lares were also usually depicted in pairs, and though their representation was usually only male, they don't have a particular mythology that limits them to that option only. The Laris are not servants in the way that the Pokemon seem to be, but they do keep a watch over the home and the family, and in return, they require gratitude and maybe a small portion of each meal. A very simple sacrifice. Similarly, Ndidi are easy to placate, thriving on appreciation. 
From these household deities to some major ones, I want to stop off in Alola, because there's really no denying how much the guardian deities are inspired by the Hawaiian religion. The Hawaiian religion has a multitude of gods and goddesses, but there are four major deities that we're going to look at. Kanaloa, who is associated with the ocean and the underworld. Tapu Fini can control the ocean and has connections with the other side. For one thing, its fog can tear through the barrier between the living and the dead, and for another, its location in Japanese is not the ruins of hope, it's the ruins of the other side. Which I probably should have brought up in last week's video, but spilled milk tank. Lono, who's associated with peace, and whose four-month-long festival was associated with not doing unnecessary work. Like, non-essential laborers didn't work for four months, and played and enjoyed the fruits of their agricultural labor, and had religious ceremonies. I seriously want that union. Tapu Bulu, who by the way is my favorite guardian, is also known for its controlling of vegetation. Bulba fact, vegetation is related to agriculture. It has a generally peaceful nature, and get this, they call it the lazy Pokemon. I seriously want to dive deeper into this topic, but let's just say I have some theories about this exact phrasing. Tapu Bulu doesn't care if you call it lazy though, it understands the importance of rest. Also, it rings a bell so people know it's coming so it can avoid conflict. Do you know what this is? It's called a Kakara, or a Shakujo in Japan. And though it's attracted a host of other uses, it's basically the same concept for Buddhists. You jangle the staff as you're walking, and sentient creatures are frightened by the noise, so you don't actually kill one or get into a fight. Tapu Bulu is found in the ruins of abundance, abundance, agriculture, having the abundance to take four months off to rest, you get it. Kane, who is the highest of the four higher deities, is associated with the sun and procreation. And Tapu Lele, who can sprinkle you with these scales to heal your wounds. There's... okay, there's a bit of cruelty to Tapu Lele. So, in English, it's only hinted at because the scales it scatters can do harm if too many are used, which sounds like a warning against greed, except that it'll totally sprinkle you with extra on purpose. In Japanese, though, it's outright stated that the war it ended was likely by it goading the battle on by healing the soldiers until they fought to the death. I think this is meant to be because of Kane's association with the sun. Think of it, generally the sun is good and helpful, but there's also things like sunburn and certain cancers and heat stroke and the sun in your eyes when you're trying to head home. There's the procreation because of the healing and the sun, again, generally being good, but there's certainly the danger too. Tapu Lele is found in the ruins of procreation. I mean life. Same thing. Ku, or Kuka Ilimoku, is associated with war and politics. This is the one with the weakest link. Even though Tapu Koko is found in the ruins of conflict and can get explosively mad, it doesn't appear to be any more related to war. Instead, it's said to be fickle and picks and chooses who it helps on a whim. It can also get violent, but often forgets why it did so to begin with. Those can all be said to be coded phrases for war, but we're going to give it a pass. After all, having it go around and start actual wars would have been odd for a Pokemon game. Alola isn't the only region to be influenced by real-world mythologies and religions, though. We can look at the Sinnoh region as well. Now, I've already mentioned how Arceus and Giratina seem more to be a raw set than a god-devil, but Palkia and Dialga seem to be more fitting in Japan's own creation myth. When heaven and earth had come into being, Izanami and Izanagi dipped the Naginata, Ame no Nuhoko, into the primordial sea. In some versions of the myth, the drops that fell became the islands of Japan, but in the complete telling, the drop forms a single island, Onogoroshima, where they construct a heavenly pillar, which they use in a marriage ceremony that eventually leads to the other kami and the islands of Japan. They use a spear, and they construct a pillar to set forth the rest of creation. A spear and a pillar. Shinto is also the inspiration for the shrines, such as the one in Elix Forest, the design of Chingling and Chimeko, which resembled the protective or attention-grabbing bells in Shinto shrines, 
Almost everything to do with the episode Ghost of Maiden's Peak, including the festival itself, the boat meant to guide the spirits of the dead, the protective Ofuda, which are called anti-ghost stickers in the dub, but whatever, and even the fact that the maiden herself has been enshrined. Thunderous, Tornadus, and Landorus are based off of the kami Fujin, Raijin, and Inari, while their Therian forms are based off Quetzalcoatl, Quetzilopochtli, and Tezcatlipoca. So, a nice syncretism. Perhaps the largest influence of Shinto, however, is Tsukumogami, which is an idea that after a certain amount of time, usually a hundred years, inanimate objects can gain a kami. Going into depth about the word kami and the implications of a household object containing one is a bit tricky. It's not reverent enough to merely say that they are haunted, but it's also not like your grandmother's teapot becomes a full-on deity. But it suffices to say that many Pokémon are based on this idea. Anything that doesn't seem like it should be alive is probably a Tsukumogami, or based on one. Klefki is one example, it's possible the Clink line, Voltorb and Magnemite are Pokeballs and Magnets that have been animated, Baltoy and Clay Doll, the three pollution lines, Grimer, Coughing, and Trubbish, can be said to be pollution brought to life. Often, when people are aware of this influence, I see the additions of Baynet and other ghost Pokemon, but even though Baynet does develop its own spirit of vengeance that seeks the child who threw it away, Haunted objects aren't necessarily restricted to Shinto or Japan, especially the idea of a haunted doll. It's very much present in a lot of mythologies. In some of the other ghost Pokémon's case, like Kafra Gigas, it isn't a case of those inanimate objects developing their own spirit, it's more those objects being possessed by an already existing spirit. It's a fine line, but it's there. But that's just for me. I suppose everyone might view it a little differently. A few other Pokémon who are possibly inspired less than the others, though the influences can still be seen, are Fujin and Tezcatlipoca, who have already been mentioned also inspiring Suicune and Umbreon respectively, and Ryujin, a dragon god who rests at the bottom of the sea, inspiring Lugia. The next trio can also be seen as a matter of perspective. The weather trio in particular seems to me to be drawn from two different religions, particularly Judaism and Greco-Roman polytheism. Let me explain. There are a primordial set of creatures in Jewish mythology, the Ziz, and its better known cousins, Leviathan and Behemoth. Ziz is a giant bird, the Behemoth is a massive land creature, and Leviathan is a gigantic sea serpent. Leviathan and Behemoth specifically are said to be destructive, and this resonates with Kyogre and Groudon, and while Ziz doesn't specifically temper the other two, Rayquaza is meant to fill that role. However, there is also the possibility that these three are meant to reference the three brothers of Greco-Roman polytheism, Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades, or Jupiter, Neptune, and Pluto. The reason why is that when people are told myth, they know that the brothers pulled lots, Zeus got the sky, Poseidon got the sea, and Hades got the underworld. They might even know that it's Poseidon who was actually the bringer of earthquakes. But if I may make a drastic simplification of a complex subject real quick, Hades was often combined with another god, Pluton, or sometimes Pluton is just another name for Hades, which is where the Roman name Pluto came from. Pluton is the god of wealth, the idea being that if the dead belong to Hades and the dead are put in the ground, then obviously everything else below the ground must be his as well. And it's in this nugget that I think the weather trio might be connected to this myth. Rayquaza as the leader of the other two and the sky, Kyogre guards the sea, and Groudon is on land, controlling not what's just on the top part of the earth but what's below it as well. Kyogre can even learn Earthquake through TM. I'll admit there's a bit of speculation on that one, but in either case, religion was the primary influence, and that's really what this entire video has been about. I wanted to look at religion, a topic which normally wouldn't be covered in a franchise like Pokemon, and see how it might have influenced the games. I've been trying to temper myself about the length of my videos, and as a result, I tried not to include too many cases of mythological beings in this overview slash semi-theory slash discussion, just deities. That doesn't mean that they're not out there, it's just the line has to be drawn somewhere. It's also why I didn't include the legendary titans, they are part of Jewish folklore, but not Judaism as a religion. 
but I'd love to continue this discussion in the comments down below. If you can think of anything I might have missed, let me know. If you made it this far, I'm hoping you might subscribe for more, ring the bell, leave a like, comment, all that jazz. I will see you all next time. Thank you, and stay safe.